Without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for this evening. It's my pleasure to present Reverend Dr. Al Tizan, who is an affiliate associate professor of missional and global leadership at North Park Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. Previous leadership positions he has held include Executive Minister of Serve Globally, the International Ministries of the Evangelical Covenant Church, and co-president of Christians for Social Action. Al and his wife Janice live in the San Francisco Bay Area near their four grown children and five grandchildren and one on the way. He enjoys dogs, books, music, and hiking trails to get lost in. The title of Reverend Dr. Al Tizan's presentation is Identity Crisis, My Missionary Journey as a Filipino American in Post-Colonial Philippines. Let's welcome Reverend Dr. Al Tizan. Hi, Al, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Thank you. I sure wish I could see your, the, those who are here, but um, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the uh, applause was not an applause track. It was like live. And um, I am really glad to be here with you. Um, thank you. There it is. Okay. Thank you for the invitation to share a little bit today with you. Um, you know, I am not sure what prompted me to go the route I'm about to go, but I'm going to be a bit more biographical with you. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and begin to share my screen. All right. Well, um, you know, when... Uh, when Dr. Shao asked me to join you today, I initially thought just to give you an overview of Whole and Reconciled, the book I wrote a few years ago that essentially summarizes my theology of mission framed by the powerful, rich, dynamic theme of reconciliation. And then I would, you know, by giving that overview, we would stimulate good Q&A session later on. Now we're gonna have good, hopefully good Q&A session, but. As I prepared for our time, I, I, started, I started saying, hey, you know, I'm, I will likely be, for the most part, with fellow Asians, Asian Americans who are seeking to be faithful to the ministry of the gospel. So perhaps it's because uh, I'm with cultural family and gospel family that I feel led to be much more personal with you. So I want to share a bit of my life story that inevitably touches on many themes found in Whole and Reconciled. It's, it's a, think of it almost as a toward, toward Whole and Reconciled, uh, the book. Um, in fact, I'll even say more than touching on them, my life touching on them. I, I believe these realities and circumstances and events in my life have deeply informed, directly or indirectly, the themes of the book. You know, they say that uh, every book is part autobiographical, and uh, I agree with that. So I invite you to, uh, to, to think of, of what I have to say today as personal life markers that have led to the missional commitments found in Whole and Reconciled. So I am, the, I am the third of five children born to Filipino parents. My mother was from the Ilocano region, my father from the Pampanga region. So they spoke different languages but Tagalog was the common language they both understood. They uh, met at university. And so that was the language mostly used in my household. Within the Philippines itself, a microcosm of globalization exists with over 182 known dialects representing many cultures. My family immigrated to the United States when I was two years old because of my father's work with the Philippine government. The driving force behind my family's move to the US was socioeconomic prosperity. And for millions of Filipinos, the grand indicator of making it was and is probably for many others to have made it to the promised land of the United States of America. My father was a commercial attache for the Philippine government, which I understand is the person responsible to show hospitality to Filipino VIPs visiting um, a U.S. city to which my father was assigned at any given time. Um, and in other words, my dad was a professional party. 
And uh, growing up, we, we thought all the parties being hosted in our home were just my parents' friends getting together. But in reality, our regular visitors were dignitaries from the homeland, senators, journalists, actors, and so on. For whatever reason, my father was transferred from consulate to consulate every few years. So before I finished elementary school, we had lived in Los Angeles, Seattle twice, Honolulu, and New York City. When I was 12 years old, my father resigned from the consulate. We moved to the eastern part of Oregon to a town in which my mother was one of two medical doctors, not only in that town, but in the whole county. We moved from the Bronx, New York, picture on the left, to Umatilla, Oregon, population 750 people. There were more people in the apartment building next to us than the entire town of Umatilla, Oregon. The jump from urban to rural was an exercise in cross-cultural skills training of the starkest kind. In fact, you know, for all of the uh, crossing cultures that I've done in my life, I, I still look uh, at that experience from going, going from urban New York to rural Eastern Oregon as the biggest jump I've ever taken. It was while living in Umatilla that I remember, I remember us one by one, siblings uh, turning in, in progress, turning our green cards, uh, turning in our green cards and becoming US citizens. This um, indicated success in life, right? And from uh, our, my parents' worldview, we, we had made it out of the Philippines and into the promised land of the United States. I was 13 years old when I became a US citizen. Besides the normal growing up pains of any North American, um, children of immigrant families also have an extra set of issues related to having to negotiate between two cultures. We would begin each day in a Filipino household and then launch from there to school, to school saturated in North American culture. Dominant North American culture would often make us feel like the Filipino culture that defined our household strange and worthy of mocking, eating with a spoon and fork or sometimes with our hands, parents with accents, the smell of fried fish. And for anybody, if there's any, if any other Filipinos are in the room, bug, the smell of bagoong, uh, the rooms filled with Filipino style furniture, et cetera, et cetera. All these things reminded us that we were a strange people living in a strange land. The biggest issue Hold on a second here. The biggest issue that was, um, uh oh, let's see what happened here. The biggest issue that was unique to us, at least as we compare ourselves to our friends at school, was that we had a third parent whom we called Lola which means grandmother in Tagalog. We kids certainly regarded her as our second mother because she was the one who took care of us while my parents worked outside the home. We loved her like a mother, but my parents had a different view. She was what Filipino culture called a katulong, literally translated the help. And yes, like the movie, the help. And like the movie, Lola suffered many indignities mostly emotional abuse while working 24 seven for the family with no pay. But the quote, privilege, unquote, of living in the United States. The difference between the kids and the parents view of Lola and treatment of Lola uh, were profound and daily. The last uh, article that my late journalist brother Alex Tizon wrote before his untimely death in 2017 was about Lola. It was entitled My Family Slave, which was the cover article of the June 2017 issue of The Atlantic. I'm convinced that my commitment to the poor and oppressed and marginalized in the world is fueled not only by my understanding of the gospel, but also by my desire to advocate for the many Lolas in the world. I realized at an early age that America was not the land of equal opportunity, 
our father was quite clear, especially with his sons, that we needed to work doubly, triply, quadruply hard if we wanted to succeed here in the land of the giants. Americans, and by that I mean Euro or Anglo-Americans, will always be bigger than, than you in every way, my dad would say more than once. If they put in one hour of work, you must put in two or even three. If your classmates get A's in class, you must get A pluses, et cetera, et cetera. America is a land of opportunity, but for non-whites, we have to work much harder to take advantage of those opportunities. But even then, says my dad, no promises. In fact, be content as far as you go, but don't be too disappointed when you don't make it all the way to the top. What my father was describing is what has become known among us Asian Americans as the bamboo ceiling. On a related note, when I began to learn the mixed history of Filipinos and Americans, including the Filipino-American War in the early 20th century, I went through an intense period of anger. Realizing that part of the story of America becoming a land of opportunity was to take advantage of others, indigenous communities, slaves from Africa, and people from faraway lands like the Philippines, Guam, and other places. More on this in a bit. In 1979, I became a Christian in dramatic fashion. After four or five years of intense drug use, drug sales, and other self-destructive behaviors, um, as I reacted to the, the family chaos that eventually ended up in the divorce of my mother and father, I turned to God to save me from myself. God saw fit to hear my cry, for which I am eternally grateful. My conversion was reflective of how many other suburban youth came to faith in Christ. In 1981, I married this cute girl from Oregon named Janice, whom I met and began dating in high school shortly after I came to faith. We've been married now for 40 years and have raised four Asian white children. They're all married now and we have five grandchildren and one on the way. It was while in, in, uh, in grad school in 1985 that God smote me with mission. It occurred in part as a result of a multi-punch combination of books that included Ronald J. Sider's Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, Gustavo Gutierrez's a Theology of Liberation, and John Perkins' Let Justice Roll Down. But it was a travel course called Contemporary Issues in Missiology, Latin American Practical, that knocked me out. <laughs> Each morning began in the classroom. But after lunch, the class resumed via observation and engagement in hands-on ministry with, for, and among the poor. This daily schedule over a period of three weeks in the countries of Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Costa Rica exposed me to the blessings of the intercultural experience, the unromantic reality of poverty, and the joy of service, and the word mission on both the theoretical and practical levels. In 1989, four years after my experience in Central America and a master's in leadership and ministry, Janice and I and our then two children moved to the Philippines as a missionary family with a small, very conservative, very white, Seattle-based mission sending agency. I credit God for developing in me a love for my own people back in the United States. When, um, when um, I um, got back from that Central American class, Central American trip, I thought for sure that I was going back to Central America because I had no thought of the Philippines at all. And I thought I was going to go back in a few months. That was sort of my naivete as a, as a young Christian, I thought, hey, God's called, let's just go. Um, we, we can be there in a matter of months. Well, what turned out was that in four years after that, um, uh, I developed this, this love for my own people, something that uh, I don't believe my parents imparted. In fact, 
Um, the unwritten message that I received from them in retrospect was to forget the homeland, to be glad that we left it. Uh, they would never say it that directly, but that really, it was the message in our household. Be American, assimilate, do well, succeed here. Um, so when we went back four years later after that, uh, that call to mission that I heard in Central America, we headed back to uh, my homeland of the Philippines. We worked among the, the poor and with the poor in two squatter communities in Metro Manila, and four years later moved to Zambales province to work with families adversely affected by a, a massive volcanic eruption uh, for another five years. Um, we engaged in community development um, and, and you know, talk about community development. In the last five years, we were in this province that was completely buried by a volcanic eruption that happened in 1991, the, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo, permanently buried three provinces. One of them was Zimbales. And, um, uh, you know, this was community development from the bottom up. We, there was nothing there anymore. They had to rebuild those who survived had to rebuild on top of the solidifying lava. And, uh, you know, we started out with, with uh, tents from the government and, and food and all, all that, that, whole, uh, that whole journey, and then began to work with the government and other NGOs to uh, build roads and marketplaces and schools and churches, et cetera. Um, as I mentioned, our four children are now married. Our oldest daughter married a Guatemalan American. They have three children whom we call Guadapinos. Our son married an African American from South Philadelphia. This marriage sadly is coming to an end in a matter of months after six years. They have one Asian white black son. Our second daughter married an Anglo American from Los Angeles. They have one son and another on the way. And our youngest daughter married a young man from Crete during COVID last year. His mother is Dutch African from South Africa, his father a, 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 a Greek. Um, and uh, can't wait to see what their kids will look like, though for now they said they don't want kids. We'll, we'll see about that. Our kids and grandkids all live in the multi-ethnic milieu of the San Francisco Bay Area. My family is in and of itself developing into a picture of multi-ethnicity. Okay, shifting gears somewhat, I, I wanna share a few lessons I learned along the way about my beloved Philippines. My intense learning about it really began while living there. Again, uh, we didn't hear much about it in, at home and we certainly didn't hear anything about it in school. I learned first that before it was the Philippines and before we were Filipinos, we were Bisayans, Tagalogs, Pelucanos, Kapampangan, Etc. Island peoples separated by waters and developing into distinct culture. I learned the Spanish came with bad intentions in retrospect to occupy and claim the islands. The first recorded attempt failed when in 1521, Ferdinand Magellan's men tried to take the island of Cebu, but it was there that Magellan was killed by Chief Lapu Lapu. It wasn't until 1565, 40 plus years later, that Miguel Lopez de Legazpi came with bigger weaponry and subdued us, confiscating lands, reordering the people, renaming some of the islands and taking away the native names of the people, replacing them with Spanish names. For example, my name is Francisco Alberto Asuncion Tizan IV. It does not get any more Spanish than that. And uh, I am uh, one of the things I'm really looking forward to uh, on the other side <laughs> is my native name. I would love to know my native name before the Spanish took it away. The Spanish occupied the islands for 333 years, imposing its cultural, political, and religious, i.e. Roman Catholic will on the people. Contrary to the reputation of Filipinos that we are a docile, assimilating people, Resistance to Spanish rule began immediately. More than 300 rebellions and uprisings are recorded during Spain's rule, amounting to 
one or more revolts a year. And by the 1880s and 90s, the unrest of Filipinos had intensified boiling point. They wanted to be free from Spanish tyranny. Enter the United States, which at the time was at war with the Spaniards in other parts of the world, especially among cultures we now call Latin America. Filipinos asked the American troops in the Philippines to help them gain their freedom uh, from Spain and the Americans obliged. Filipinos and Americans fought side by side to oust the Spanish from the Philippines and they succeeded. Jubilant Filipinos celebrated their liberation, declared their independence on June 12, 1898, inaugurating General Emilio Aguinaldo as its first president. However, the Americans double crossed them claiming all along that they weren't helping them gain their independence. On the contrary, they intended to expand the American empire and establish its presence in Asia. This was the beginning of the Filipino-American War from 1899 to 1901, which was every bit as brutal as any war that has been waged. The Americans occupied the islands. Though its rule was not as overtly cruel as the Spanish, American occupation was every bit as condescending, paternalistic, and culture manipulating as the previous colonizers. Then in 1941, the Japanese brutally took over the islands, ousting the Americans and killing tens of thousands of Filipinos. They occupied the islands with a brutality that the people had never experienced. My parents told us stories of that time, bayonetting infants and imprisoning people for any act deemed disrespectful. The Bataan death march was part of this, etc. So when American General Douglas MacArthur made good on his I shall return promise in 1945 to liberate the Philippines from Japanese rule, he and, uh, he and the United States, at least for the generations of my parents, were put on a very high pedestal. The Philippines was granted its independence by the United States and became the Republic of the Philippines in 1946. But as some have argued, the neo-colonialism continues to this day. Now I have called this presentation Identity Crisis, My Missionary Journey as a Filipino American in Post-Colonial Philippines. So I, I just wanna share a few missiological insights with you that I've collected through the years as I reflect on my missionary journey as a Philippine American in a post-colonial world. And then, um, and then I look forward to our Q&A time. First, I wanna say that I love the Philippines. I will, never, I will never understand me fully if I don't fully understand my ethnicity and my culture. But I also love the United States. Maybe I should hate it as one who knows what happened to the Philippines at the hands of Americans at the turn of, this, of the 20th century, but I don't hate it. I can't hate it because by hating it, I would be hating myself. I used to call this dilemma an identity crisis. And in some ways, you know, it'll always be a, some, some tension, but in a hybridized sort of way for good or for bad, I am truly Filipino. American. Negotiating the multicultural contours of my being, I see how my faith is distinctly shaped and equipped to challenge racism, classism, and bad mission practices. Second then, uh, so a second insight then, is that cultural hybridity, um, instead of looking at it as a kind of contamination, really it positions us to challenge the divisions that mar our world. It positions us as Christians to bear witness to the whole gospel throughout the whole world. Related to this and thirdly, I've come to the belief that the nations need each other. The Philippines needs the United States and the United States needs the Philippines. The nations of the world need one another to be the world. And when I translate this interdependence to the church, I see how crucial it is for the global church coming together to engage God's mission together. 
we need to be pro-world. Not pro-America, not pro-Philippines, not pro-anything, but pro-world to participate in God's mission to redeem the world. Fourthly, it's important to acknowledge that we indeed live in a post-colonial world. Acknowledging this, uh, this truth regularly reminds us that we should go about life, church, and mission post-colonially. No kingdom but God's kingdom is over us, and we should minister accordingly in our communities and beyond. I don't want to continue the colonial legacy in any way, shape, or form. Now, I'm hyper aware of this, and I urge us all to be as well. What this means is that the gospel to which we bear witness must always be experienced as good news. Good news, not bad news to the lost, the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, the traumatized. In a post-colonial world, there should be no longer, there should no longer be victims of the Great Commission. Whatever we do in the name of Jesus in the Philippines or anywhere in the world, we must retain the goodness of the good news. If anyone uh, is going to take offense at the gospel, let it be those who oppress, those who take advantage, those in power, take advantage of, of, of those who are not in power. And lastly, our post-colonial world is a fractured and fracturing world. Colonialism and its consequences of racism, classism, genocide, wars, messed up boundaries, and gross power imbalances has left the world in shambles. As representatives of the kingdom of God, the global church's mission is to be reconcilers, proclaimers of good news, champions of justice, healers of the wounded, and peacemakers between tribes and nations until Christ returns.